Uh, Your Excellency, ladies and gentlemen, good evening. Um, I am Natasas Vezuri, President of the Macedonian Society of Great Britain, and on behalf of the Executive Committee, I would like to welcome you tonight. I would like also to thank you for your support over the years and going forward. Uh, the program tonight includes introduction of the, of the guest, Professor Stathis Kalivas, by Dr. Chrysa Labrinaku, lecturer on the University College London and member of the committee, illustrated lecture by Dr. Stathis Kalivas, followed by questions and answers and the reception afterwards. Thank you. Good evening. Professor Kalivas is Professor of Political Science and Director of the Program on Order, Conflict and Violence at Yale University. He is the author of a number of books. His most recent book is the book called Modern Greece, What Everyone Needs to Know, which was published a few months ago in 2015. The other books include The Logic of Violence in Civil War, published in 2006, and The Rise of Christian Democracy in Europe, which was published in 1996. In addition, he is the co-author of the book Order, Conflict and Violence, which was published in 2008. Since 2009, he has also been the author of a bi-weekly column in the Greek daily newspaper Ikathimerini. He has received several awards, including Woodrow Wilson Award for Best Book on Government, Politics or International Affairs, the Lubert Award for Best Book in Comparative Politics, the European Academy of Sociology Book Award in 2008, the J. David Greenstone Award for Best Book in Politics and History, and the Gregory Lubert Award for Best Article in Comparative Politics. He has received the last award three times, in 2001, 2009, and 2011. He's the recipient of a number of fellowships and grants, including a grant from the European University Institute, the Harry Frank Guggenheim Foundation, the, the United States Peace Institute, and the Falk Bernadotte Academy. He is a fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences and the John Simon Guggenheim Memorial Foundation. In today's lecture, Professor Kalivas will review and discuss the various stages of the Greek crisis from its eruption in, in 2009 to the present. He will consider its place in the broader context of Greek history and the process of European integration, monetary and political, comparing and contrasting political and economic dynamics, as well as domestic, European and international ones. His lecture will draw on the arguments of his recently published book, Modern Greece, What Everyone Needs to Know. The central theme of that book is that Greece is a trailblazer. For two century, centuries, Greece has launched ambitious projects of democratization and economic development, some of which, as we all know, were quite successful. However, what is not worthy is the epic disasters that have characterized the Greek historical tra trajectory. The 2009 financial crisis is the latest one. As Professor Kalivas explains in his book, and he will explain to us here shortly, uh, the contradiction between failure and success is due to a key recur recurring pattern in the course of Greek history, namely a succession of peculiar boom and bust cycles. Please welcome Professor Kalivas. Well, thanks very much for this very nice introduction. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be here tonight and to share some of my reflections. In fact, this is a much more um, a broader historical overview uh, of the trajectory of the Greek state, of the modern Greek state and the Greek nation. It draws very much on the book that was published uh, by Oxford University Press uh, in, the, uh, in May 2015. I reworked and expanded the argument for the Greek edition of the book that has a different title in Greek. Uh, it's called um, Disasters and Triumphs, Catastrophes Catriamvi. And I've also expanded even more and uh, refined the argument for the new edition that is, should be coming out recently. So it's a work in progress, and it gives me great pleasure to uh, share some of those reflections. Very much like um, a lot of people in this room, the crisis has been the trigger for trying to understand exactly what caused it, but not only what caused the most recent crisis, but 
how we can explain it in, in the, what the, the French historians would call the long durée, the, 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 the longer duration of time. Uh, and so I thought I would start by reading you uh, a passage from uh, uh, a very um, important and interesting uh, memoir that was published in Greece in 1948 by uh, a British uh, uh, classicist uh, and officer of the uh, Special Operations Executive, uh, Christopher Montague Woodhouse. Uh, and in his book, famous book called uh, The Apple of Discord, in his introduction, he gives it an overview of the, of the state, so to speak, of the Greek state. So let me read that, that passage. He says, um, he describes the, uh, the attempt by the Metaxas regime to uh, reform the Greek state. And, and, he, and he says, and I'm quoting, the task which he had set before himself and his ostensibly provisional government was to create the Greek state to give it the stability, the cohesion, the self-respect which characterize an independent state and which despite a hundred years of freedom, Greece had not yet secured. Hitherto there had been Greek statesmen, but there had been no Greek state. There had been Harilos Trikoupis in the 19th century and Eleftherios Venizelos in the 20th century. But an examination of the lives of those statesmen reveals that behind and beneath them there was no state. So long as they were in power, there was progress in the welfare of the people and the condition of the country. But when the ordinary processes of democracy replaced them by their opponents, uh, what they had achieved was undone. The achievement of Venizelos in particular raised the international status of Greece to one of wide respect. But the passage of time showed that although Venizelos himself was among the greatest European statesmen of his time, the state which he appeared to represent did not exist. The wide respect which was being accorded personally to Venizelos and vicariously to Greek antiquity, but not to the Greek state. His intermittent displacement from office revealed behind the facade an administrative anarchy. And he concludes, and which Metaxas set himself to cure, was that Greece could not be a state as England or France was a state in the 20th century European meaning of the, of the term until Greece had entered 20th century Europe. This is a, um, a very typical um, passage uh, that one finds throughout uh, the Greek history from the very, be very beginning of the independence and even just before, during the, uh, the years of the War of Independence up to the recent years of the crisis. Uh, as we're going to see, a lot of people who come to Greece display, uh, describe the situation in which uh, the Greek state is not functioning, uh, there is corruption and the politicians do not operate as they should. Uh, it is a passage that in its points sounds uh, so natural uh, and so self-evident as to not need any particular support. It sounds true to our ears, but I'm going to argue even though it's correct in its characterization, it can be also quite misleading. And it leads us in a direction of understanding the trajectory of the modern Greek uh, state that can be quite problematic and I wish to question, to challenge, and to revise tonight. So this is the widespread perception, a very interesting book that contains a lot of similar descriptions. You can al almost lift those descriptions from the past. It's a, a very small volume by Michael Lewis called Boomerang. Uh, where he visits, he's a famous American journalist, he visits various countries undergoing crisis in Europe and describes their characteristics. And of course, the emphasis in Greece is on some of the themes that have uh, permeated uh, public understanding um, of Greece, especially corruption, tax evasion, etc. But there is also scholarly work in that respect. There is a recent paper by two economists, um, Reinhardt and Trobisch, in which they find that you can actually model the course of Greek economic history as a set of cycles uh, of extreme borrowing and of default followed by bailout. Uh, in fact, Greece has spent, as we're going to see, a very long time of its history excluded from financial markets precisely because of these defaults. Uh, and just to give you a very small taste uh, of that set of arguments that you've, said, yet, that you've, thought, that you've probably encountered very often, um, Roger Cohen, a, a famous um, op-ed writer for the New York Times, in one of his um, op-ed columns published in 2011, he writes precisely the same thing, that in fact, uh, what is the history of the modern Greek state is a series of disasters, of epic disasters, and then he goes and names some of them, we're going to review them, um, and 
try to make sense of them. So all of those descriptions of a permanently dysfunctional Greek state and a permanently dysfunctional Greek society, I think, raise a puzzle uh, which needs to be at least addressed. And the puzzle is the following one. So on the one hand, we have this perception, which sounds very true, rings very true, of Greece as a perennial underachiever. But at the same time, when you look at where Greece is uh, at this point in history, even after all these excruciating years of economic crisis, it, is really, um, uh, it really performs quite well when compared to the global average. It's, a, one could say, a top 40 uh, nation in terms of GDP per capita, in terms of a variety of metrics about human development, about life expectation, about health, um, about um, the economists had a very nice um, uh, ranking of countries in which it is good to be born, and Greece was ranking quite high. So that raises a very interesting question, which is, um, becomes even more interesting when you think that Greece actually outperforms countries that have had uh, a much easier e history than itself. And when you place Greece it's in, it's, it's, uh, in its actual historical context, then you, you see this puzzle even growing. So the question is how to make sense of that puzzle, how to explain it, or if I want to put it a, li a little bit more provocatively, how does Greece succeed by failing? Uh, which I think would be a way to describe this puzzle. So what I'm going to do tonight uh, is to reframe the big question about Greece's failures and then try to um, go over Greece's record and provide you with my take of uh, uh, Greek history, my reinterpretation of Greek history, explaining this puzzle, and then concluding with a very brief review of what, uh, of, of the title of my presentation, what is Greece, or more precisely, what is Greece a case of? What does it represent if we place it on a global scale? And finally, I'm going to close with a few thought, uh, thoughts about the future, not trying to predict the future, but trying to see how the past may shed some light into the future. So let's start with the question, what is Greece? As I said, the different formulation to ask this question is to ask what is Greece a case of? What does it represent? What does it stand for? And I think that allows us to answer it in a way that is perhaps more systematic and less metaphysical. So the question of what is Greece has motivated, as is natural, um, a lot of Greeks since the uh, inception of the modern Greek state, but also it's a question that has stood at the center uh, of a lot of uh, the interpreters of Greece abroad, outside Greece. And I would argue it's a question with a particularly uh, pronounced existential dimension, uh, especially because of the legacy uh, of Greece, the ancient legacy of Greece. And the, you can basically, if you read and sift through a lot of these observations, you can distinguish two different perspectives. One perspective uh, emphasizes very much the legacy of Greece, sees Greece as a legacy. And the second one, which is the flip side of the first one, Greece sees Greece as a phony, as an interloper. Uh, and I would argue that both of those views are, are in fact interchangeable, and very often the same people hold both views and change them depending on the circumstances. So the uh, argument of Greece as a legacy is probably very well known to you. It emphasizes the fact that Greece is a placeholder for this uh, famous and glorious ancient civilization that constituted that connection of modern Greece to ancient Greece has been, I would argue, the cornerstone of Greece, uh, Greece's identity uh, and most Greeks' understanding of themselves. And it has been a very popular idea in the West from the very beginning. In fact, the idea of the connection between a modern Greek state and ancient Greece, in fact, originated very much in Western Europe. Uh, and in fact, through the Romantic movement in Germany during the early 19th century. However, it's ultimately, even though it's a, it's a very um, uh, ambitious understanding of one's identity, it can also be quite self-defeating. In what ways? Well, you can never live up to this kind of comparison. Whenever you compare yourself to this glorious civilization, you are, um, in a sense, doomed to underperform. You cannot reach the level uh, that this civilization reached, and therefore, you are, in a sense, uh, condemned to uh, feel insecure in terms of your achievements. And that leads us to the second perspective, Greece as a phony, uh, 
which is almost a natural follow-up of the first view. So if you start uh, from uh, the assumption that Greece is the direct descendant uh, of this glorious civilization, and then you observe what you see, you notice a discrepancy between the modern and the ancient. And so the natural inclination for many observers of Greece, but also for many Greeks, is to say that there is something wrong, that it is not possible that the descendants of those famous ancient Greeks can be behaving so badly, and therefore they are not the real descendants. And this is a theme that you find throughout Greek history, Greek history is, is very common. And so the argument here is that the modern Greeks are not the real Greeks, which makes the Greeks feel very bad and react very badly. And therefore, and an extension of that uh, is an argument that we've seen emerge throughout the recent crisis that the Greeks are not real Europeans, that they don't really belong to Greece, and, and Greece is, is in fact a country that has no place in Europe. Uh, so Greece as a phony uh, is a very common position. In fact, one of the most, I would say, uh, the closest friends of Greece, uh, the former pre French president uh, Valéry Giscard d'Estaing, gave an interview a few years back in which he precisely made this point. He said, Greece is an oriental country. It should have never been part of Europe. And that's a person who, uh, by any kind of standards, holds um, a, uh, warm feelings towards Greece. So that's a very powerful kind of argument that uh, is around. So that then becomes the sort of standard explanation for Greece's failures, that the country pretends to be something that it is not, and therefore um, fails because it is just not what it pretends to be. But I think it's not a sound uh, way of thinking, and it leads us to um, very uh, unproductive directions. Very often, for example, the Greeks have fought very hard in order to prove that they were the real descendants of the ancient Greeks, which is, I don't think, a very productive, uh, uh, as I'm, I'm going to argue, direction uh, of defense. So let's examine the record of Greece to try to at, at least see what are the facts when it comes to the question of Greece's underperformance and failure. When you look at the present crisis, what is striking is the fact uh, that it is not the first one. And that is true for every country. All countries have gone through major crises in their history, and Greece is no exception to that respect. But then when you look more carefully, it very often seems that Greece tends to have uh, a particular propensity uh, to get embroiled in this big crisis. Um, so people have described Greece uh, in, in those ways, as, as I said, as a perennial underachiever, a phony European, and uh, a series of epic and endless disasters and calamities. Uh, and if you look just at the 20th century, it's very easy to generate a laundry list of those disasters. In fact, uh, these were the standard types of arguments that you saw in most of the uh, media describing uh, or attempting to explain the causes behind the Greek crisis. Five major wars in the 20th century, including a major civil war, brutal foreign occupation, massive population displacement in the 1920s, and afterwards, several military coups two major autocracies, several minor ones. So overall, when you look at this kind of laundry list, you reach an understanding of Greece as a uh, dysfunctional and unstable country and society prone to strife. You can, you, you, you can turn this analysis by focusing on economics and, and make it even more, in a sense, reliable by looking at Greece's economic record. And what you see here is that half of Greece's history has been spent in a situation of exclusion from financial markets. Greece could not borrow because it had defaulted on its loans. In fact, uh, Greece tops Europe in that respect. Uh, and according to one um, analysis, a famous paper by Reinhardt and Rogoff in 2009, it's the third country globally after Honduras and Ecuador in terms of uh, its time spent outside uh, financial markets. And a recent paper that I just referenced also emphasizes very much the unusual extent, not only of the fact that Greece is very much, uh, has been very much in debt, uh, dependent, depending, dependent on debt, but also that this debt has been external debt as opposed to domestic debt. And in fact, that paper points out to, and emphasizes a, a situation of recurring cycles of high indebtedness, default, and then bailouts. So if you take all this into account, you reach the conclusion, well, that there is no puzzle. In fact, Greece 
has always been in crisis. There is nothing particular, nothing specific about this time. So the real question we should be asking is what explains when Greece is not in crisis? Uh, but I think, again, that this is misleading and that we should rethink and revisit uh, this type of analysis and this type of interpretation. So by reframing the question, I would say that rather than look into Greece's present, past in order to, in a sense, explain in a selective fashion its present, we can use the opportunity of the crisis in order to rethink in a more systematic and more comprehensive way Greece's modern past as it is. And what I'm going to do is precisely uh, to try to explain uh, Greece's uh, disastrous walk, so to speak, to eventual success and achievement, which sounds, in the context of the present crisis, incredibly provocative, to say the least. So let's look at the record, the historical record of the major critical points in modern Greek history in a way that does not just cherry pick the disasters. What do we get if we do that? And that leads us to try to rethink and reinterpret the modern history, modern history of Greece, which was the task that I set myself when I started uh, reading the book. So we'll do that through very, very, uh, four very brief steps. We're going first to review the major busts in Greek history, both political, military, and economic. But then we're going to see how those busts emerge out of uh, very seven very highly ambitious projects. Uh, and then we'll see how the bailouts came about uh, and what followed those bailouts, which is very often disregarded, which are big rebounds that followed. Uh, and I'm going to argue, and it's a point that uh, I'm going to make quite forcefully, that the, the bailouts have a very interesting characteristic. They tend to not erase all the gains that were made during the periods of the booms. So the first step, the big busts, the, the history of, of the Greek disasters. Now, instead of just producing a laundry list, it makes sense to actually see those disasters as critical junctures in Greek history and try to make sense of them in a more comprehensive way. And if we do that, I think we can distinguish seven big busts, which are those busts. The first one is, in fact, the military failure of the Greek War of Independence, uh, which was militarily defeated, uh, and, uh, and as a result, at some point between 1825 and uh, 18, 1827, the Greek cause was very much close to, uh, to disappear. Uh, the second big disaster comes at the end of the 19th century and caps, in a sense, uh, a century-wide effort to create a modern Greek state. Uh, and it's capped in 1893 by a major economic default and in 1897 by a major military defeat. And, and that leads to, uh, as we're going to see, to international receivership. Uh, the third big bust is Greece's uh, Anatolian disaster the attempt to expand the country to make it a major regional power, which led to uh, the, tremendously, the tremendous tragedy of the displacement of a million Orthodox Christians from Anatolia to Greece. The fourth big bust are the 1940s in Greece. A, a terrible war, terrible occupation, and then a succession of civil conflicts uh, that in fact, uh, for many people, uh, as you are going to see, uh, was considered as the end, perhaps, of, of the Greek state. Then in 1967, we have uh, the last successful military coup in Europe, uh, ushering one of the uh, last dictatorships in, in Europe, uh, which really uh, caused uh, a tremendous amount of consternation. Uh, it's very difficult to forget today, especially for those who were too young during those times, the extent to which that was shocking uh, for the rest of Europe. Then um, I would argue the late 80s and the early 90s saw a situation that came extremely close to co complete collapse with a political a combination of lethal combination of political instability uh, and economic, almost economic default. And then finally we have the tremendous crisis that started in 2009. So I would, I would argue that even though there are many ways to slice the evidence, that those are seven critical points uh, that can be understood as major disasters with a lot of tremendous consequences. So what's common about those, those disasters, uh, which are very different from each other and have very different characteristics? Well, what is extremely interesting to observe is the extent to which they tend to attract a tremendous amount of international attention. 
uh, which is not common. When you look at the comparative evidence, usually most countries, especially small countries and countries whose population and size is not really significant on a global scale, do not attract a tremendous amount of attention. In fact, if you read uh, the historiography of all the Balkan states except Greece, the common theme that goes through them uh, is the sense by uh, various Balkan writers uh, of how the West doesn't care about them and how it has abandoned them in various stages in their history. In Greece, it's exactly the opposite. Greeks complain about uh, being too much, having been too much the focus and the center of the attention uh, of foreign uh, powers. So why is it that Greece has attracted so much international attention? I would argue because a lot of the crises, a lot of the busts in which it got involved have been associated with processes of global importance, very much like the last crisis. It's a Greek crisis, but at the same time, it's a European crisis. Uh, some of those bigger processes are processes of um, Im imperial disaggregation. Greece was, in fact, um, launched the process of disaggregation of one of the major empires of its time, the Ottoman Empire. Uh, Greece's history illustrates both the benefits, but also the pitfalls uh, of post-imperial irredentism. Um, it is very much associated with mass ethnic cleansing. In fact, uh, historians of, of the 1920s and the so-called exchange of population be between Greece and Turkey consider that uh, as a critical event that's essential for understanding similar processes, for example, during the Second World War, but also uh, major processes such as uh, the partition of Pakistan and India. Uh, the Greek Civil War was the frontline war of the Cold War and really triggered a tremendous amount of international effort in that respect. Uh, a very little known aspect, uh, the tremendously successful uh, developmental breakthrough of Greece in the 1950s and 60s, in which Greece managed in, in the space of one generation to become a developed country, um, uh, was a tremendous success. Greece, uh, in a sense, uh, was able to generate levels of growth during that period that were second only to Japan. Um, the democratization of Greece, the return of the democratic regime in uh, 1974, is in fact one of the first uh, processes that announces what is known in the literature of political science as the third wave of democratization, which in a sense inaugurates a process through which liberal democracy becomes uh, a sort of global regime from being in fact a very limited and minority type of political regime. And finally, the uh, current crisis, I think, is very much associated with this process of European integration. So we can see how Greece manages to be, in a sense, at the cusp of those bigger processes. And because of that, I, th I, I would argue, it is able to attract all this attention. At the same time, I, I would argue, uh, looking at the busts and the disasters is only half the picture. In order to understand how those disasters come about, you have to understand what are the projects that generated them. And when you look at the projects, realize that these are incredible projects in their ambition and reach, and very often uh, overlooked, and what is also surprising, not very known and very neglected by the Greeks, them, the Greeks themselves, and I would argue as a result of this emphasis of, on the ancient past. So which are those big projects that are really worth studying, I think, and have very often a, a sort of exemplary value from uh, a more comparative perspective. Well, the first one is the formation of a European type state in what is at, at that time uh, the Ottoman periphery of Europe. The idea that you can actually implant a European state in an Ottoman society, because this is what uh, the set of institutions formal and informal and norms that existed in that territory were, I think this is an incredibly ambitious project. The second one is the idea of uh, not just creating an independent nation state, but also creating the trappings uh, of modern institutions politically, socially, and economically, uh, which was incredibly ambitious, which, is, which occupies uh, Greece's 19th century. The third big project, which here is much more common to many other nations, is to aggrandize themselves. But of course, in terms of, because of Greece, Greek, Greece's ancient legacy and because of its um, perception as coming down a long chain uh, of very glorious uh, historical uh, episodes, including the Byzantine Empire, there is an outsized ambition about what Greece can become in terms of uh, a state. 
In the 1920s, uh, especially between 1928 and 1932, uh, and this is a period, again, that is not very well known, Greece, through the second period of the Venizelos prime ministership, launches a very ambitious program of institutional modernization, which is going to eventually be stopped by the Great Depression uh, and eventually by the Second World War. But it's a very ambitious project and creates some of the institutions um, that ex continue to exist today. Between, as I said, 1950 and 1974, we have a period of continuous economic expansion and growth, which takes Greece out uh, of underdeveloped, and it's one of the first countries to modernize uh, in a way that prefigures, for example, the modernization today of many Asian societies. It's the period in which, as economists say, people go from working barefoot to working, working with shoes, or living in houses, from living in houses with animals inside to living uh, in houses with um, uh, interior plumbing. The period between 1974 and 2000 is the period of uh, political modernization. After Greece achieved uh, this uh, immense leap, uh, it had to modernize its political institutions and create a functional liberal democracy, uh, and to a large extent, it managed to achieve that. And finally, uh, the project that led us to this uh, latest crisis is nothing less than basically giving Greece uh, a currency that's associated with countries that have a much more advanced um, economy and, and very different norms and standards. Uh, and the common element across all these projects is the idea that you can teach a baby to swim by throwing the baby in the water. That by uh, pushing the country beyond what is realistic to expect from it, that you can force it to move ahead. And I would argue that in spite of all these disasters, these have been, at the end of the day, quite successful. This is how Greece has managed to, achi to achieve a lot of, of the very big successes and achievements that we don't very often recognize. So the key driver of, of these big projects is an outsized ambition. And the reason why Greece has had this outsized ambition, I think, has to do with the nature of its elites, which from the very beginning were very cosmopolitan, uh, Greece had always had a very strong diaspora, a very strong presence abroad, and so uh, the presence of those elites with, with their um, cosmopolitan outlook has led very often to the adoption of these very um, um, ambitious projects. Uh, that has also washed down to ambitious political leaders, and there are a number of them um, uh, in the course of Greek history, the people who are instrumental in putting Greece uh, on the track of those projects. And I would also argue that uh, Greeks have been very successful in using the uh, symbolic capital of the ancient legacy as an argument uh, to achieve goals that would have not been achieved um, uh, easier otherwise and have not been achieved by comparable countries. As I said, those ambitious projects almost always end up in those major busts. However, and that's the point that I made before, and what is different from other uh, states of similar size, uh, they are followed by international bailouts. And this is, I think, a truly remarkable point. And very often people observe only the negative side of those bailouts. For example, in the paper that I mentioned by Reinhardt and Trobesch, the main argument is because Greece has been the subject of bailouts, it hasn't had the extent of independence uh, politics that other countries have had, but one has to see uh, the two sides of the same coin. And it's certainly very unusual in, com in a comparative perspective, the extent to which Greece has been the recipient of that international attention. So what have been those bailouts? Well, the first one uh, was the bailout that led to Greece's independence. Uh, the major, the three power intervention that led to the establishment of the modern Greek state, the imposition uh, uh, as a diktat to the Ottoman Empire that an independent Greek state should be formed. The second one, and is very little studied, but there is an excellent study of it by uh, a Greek economic historian, Yorgos Dertilis, is the history of the International Financial Commission that took over Greece after the, uh, the defeat of 1897 and completely reorganized the country, thus making, it, uh, making possible the, uh, the major successes of the 20th century. It's a period of extreme depression in the country. It's a period of major migration uh, when about you know, hundreds of thousands of Greeks leave Greece mostly towards the United States. 
but it's also a period in which the foundations for the next period are going, are going to be laid. Uh, the 1920s witnesses, in, in a sense, a very uh, important achievement, which is the resettlement in a country of five million, of one million impoverished refugees from Anatolia, a lot of whom did not speak Greek. Uh, the fact that there was a major land reform that allowed them uh, to establish, to establish, that allowed this population to establish itself, to be successful, uh, and not to create a sense of permanent exclusion and marginalization that is often associated with processes of ethnic cleansing and population displacement. The 1940s and the disasters of the 1940s led to the formulation of the Truman Doctrine, the Marshall Plan, which laid the foundation both for Greece's participation in the post-war community of the Western world, uh, when in fact it would have gone in the opposite direction with uh, very easy to um, uh, anticipate consequences, but also uh, allowed, uh, created the foundation for the big boom uh, of the 1950s and 60s. The 1974 transition to democracy uh, was facilitated by the fact uh, that Europe, and especially France and other nations of Europe, uh, promised Greece membership in the European uh, economic community at the time before Spain and Portugal or anyone else uh, joined. And actually the process through which Greece joined became a sort of exemplar, as recent scholarship has shown, for the process of uh, extension of the boundaries of the European Union. In fact, uh, people have argued that this is when uh, Europe starts understanding themselves not as a very small club of Central European nations, but something much larger and much more uh, coterminous with the European continent. And in the 1990s, um, I would argue uh, that uh, the funding uh, that, in a sense, allowed Greece to avoid uh, the terrible disaster of the early 90s uh, led the way and paved the way, for better or worse, for the uh, very big expansion uh, and economic growth that followed, most of which has been lost in the present crisis, but not all of which has been lost. Um, and finally, we're just witnessing the latest bailout, and we cannot comment on its outcome because we do not know what it's going to be. But when I look at it from a historical perspective, it reminds me very much of the period that I mentioned before in the late 1890s and early 1900s, in which the International Financial Commission was running uh, the Greek economy. So, as I said, there are many reasons uh, why Greece has been the object of so much international attention, but the main argument is that it's been uh, a very early mover in those bigger processes than itself, and plus, it has used the ancient legacy to its advantage, and the ancient legacy has a very convenient rhetoric uh, weapon, so to speak, in order to justify uh, these processes. It has taken advantage of uh, its strategic position, its geography, which is not always uh, very easy, and has had a very good diplomacy as well, taking uh, siding, for example, with the winners of the major uh, global wars of the time, and there has been some measure of luck as well. Uh, Greece has been, I would argue, a rather lucky country overall, in spite of all its terrible disasters. Of course, bailouts are very humiliating. Nobody likes to be bailed out. Uh, however, they greatly mitigated the cost of the busts. They induced a lot of pain, but at the same time, they also induced a lot of discipline and uh, provided uh, the opportunity for major reforms that would have been impossible otherwise. There is a flip side as well. They created a lot of moral hazard in the sense that they cultivated an overconfidence in Greece. They uh, prepared the ground for additional risky decisions. And they also created a misplaced sense of grandiosity, uh, creating in Greece a sense uh, that their culture and legacy was so important as to, in a sense, justify in and of itself uh, this kind of international attention. And also, I think, and this is the major negative effect of those bailouts, they've created a set of misincentives to actually uh, generate robust uh, domestic institutions able to withstand shocks, uh, precisely because there was always an expectation of some sort of external assistance. But overall, I would argue uh, that the impact of those international bailouts has been rather positive in that it allowed the country not to lose the total sum of what it had won in the previous period, 
and also laying the ground for the next round of ambitious projects and ambitious and epic disasters at the same time. So these are the big rebounds that follow, and that allow us to make sense of some of the major achievements of Greece. If you look at the record of Greece, despite of the problems of the Greek state that all the observers notice, uh, it is actually, I would argue, a quite successful state given the conditions under which it was created and the um, geographical context in which it was created. The uh, uh, thing that one should keep in mind is that Greece in the 1820s, when what was the geographic area of Greece, was one of the most backwards areas of the Ottoman Empire and one of the less endowed in natural resources. If you were to ask an observer in the 1820s, which part of the Ottoman Empire you think is going to become the most successful one 150 years later, nobody would have picked Greece. Uh, probably the candidate at the time was Egypt. Um, Greece provides a very interesting record of uh, very important reforms that have been achieved, uh, including the very ambitious program of um, agricultural reform and land redistribution, as I mentioned, the refugee resettlement and the recovery after the, uh, after the civil war. Uh, a lot of those are not really well known and well understood in Greece. Um, Greece has been extraordinarily early in introducing a parliamentary uh, political system uh, and a system of democracy and democratic elections in which a very large proportion of its population became enfranchised, of men of course, very early. So the history of military coups and instability does not really correspond to the actual record. Greece has, has, has had a, a tradition of parliamentary life that goes very much back into the past. Um, and it has had, as I said, this remarkable economic miracle of the 50s, 60s, and 70s, the Greek miracle, as people described it. Uh, I mentioned the seamless transition to democracy and also the fact that overall, globally, Greece finds itself today, in spite of everything, uh, in a good position globally. So overall, Greece is the most successful post-Ottoman state. Now, people may look down on that because a lot of people in Greece would think that, well, Greece should not have anything to do with the Ottoman legacy, but the fact of the matter is that Greece is born out of the Ottoman world. And that is, I think, a very important achievement. So to conclude, what is Greece a case of? I would argue that it is a case of very early, highly ambitious, perennially incomplete, but overall successful modernization. So modernity in the sense of becoming part of the West, of the most advanced nations and the most successful nations of the world has always been the goal of Greece. It's a goal that is never completely reached, but my argument is that it motivates the country because it's always a sort of moving target. And that leads me to the future. What should we expect? Well, you should never extrapolate the past into the future. That's lesson number one. Because rebounds and successes followed busts in the past does not mean that this is going to be the case in the future. But we should ask ourselves, what are the conditions under which, for example, that seventh cycle could actually resemble the past six cycles? So far, we've had the very big boom, the 90s, 2000s. We've had the enormous bust, and we have had the bailout, but we are not really seeing much more. So we have to wait to see what is going to happen. But I'll give you one observation which is striking and which came from uh, reading this very interesting book about the history of the modern Greek state by, by the Greek historian, uh, the economic historian, uh, Yorgos Dertilis. And what he says is that uh, something that you find in a variety of other settings, for example, my main um, research agenda uh, is the study of civil wars. And one of the things that you find when you study wars is how people in the midst of a war cannot possibly imagine that there is a future without it. How that is the present completely dominates their imagination. And the same is the case uh, in the situations of crisis. People cannot possibly think that there may be a turning point uh, actually quite close to where they are. They are just incapacitated by the present. And I think that's a very important thing. Again, I'm not going to argue that that necessarily predicts a success, but certainly I would argue that it overdetermines the feeling uh, of pessimism that prevails in the country. And to justify um, my point and give a note of optimism, 
Uh, I'll give you a very nice example, which is the example uh, by Paul Porter, the man you see in the middle of the picture. is a very interesting person. He was a personal envoy of President Truman in Greece. And he visited Greece in 1946 when Greece was, in a sense, sinking into deeper and deeper civil conflicts. Uh, that was the beginning uh, of the Cold War. The British, in fact, had declared that they couldn't possibly assist Greece. And so Paul Porter, very dynamic American guy, as you can see from the picture, arrives in Greece with a commission to start to figure out what is going on in this country and writes a very interesting report that has been published. And at the end of the report, he also writes a summary, which he publishes in a magazine uh, named Colliers. Uh, in September 20, 1947. And the title of the article is Wanted, a Miracle in Greece, in which he provides a very nice analysis of the Greek situation that resonates uh, very true today, so much so that people who read that very often are tempted to say that nothing ever changes in Greece, which is not true. So just to give you a few examples from that article, he says, the late King George of Greece, in my first talk with him, referred to many government employees as camp followers and coffee house politicians, and described the whole civil service as a kind of pension system for political hacks. These were harsh words, but not unwarranted. The civil service is overexpanded, underpaid, and demoralized. Sounds very contemporary. Next point, reform appears impossible. So he, he writes, the result is complete disorganization. I have never seen an administrative structure which for sheer incompetence and ineffectiveness was so appalling. The civil service simply cannot be relied upon to carry out the simplest functions of government, the collection of taxes, the enforcement of economic regulations, the repair of roads. And the task is enormous. So he reaches the conclusion. He says all that the US mission to Greece has to do is end a civil war eliminate corruption in government ranks, rebuild the economy of a nation, and revive hope in a people sunk in despair. But he's American, and he's optimistic. He says, well, there's a chance they will do it. And he concludes his article in Colliers by saying, I think Americans have enough resourcefulness and perseverance to lick the problem. If we are defeated in Greece, it will be crushing, a crushing moral and strategic blow to our new international role, solar plexus. But if we can leave Greece in a state of economic and political health, we will have brought new hope and new faith to a freedom-loving people, uh, freedom people everywhere in the world. So the point here is that by recognizing the high stakes for the United States, uh, they were motivated to invest the energy. And that's only half the story. The other half of the story is that the Greeks did their part. As you know, Americans have thrown enormous resources in other countries facing civil wars, for example, South Vietnam, with very different results. So I give you this kind of note of optimism as a way to think about the future, and I want you to thank you very much for your attention.
κύριε Στάθη Καλίβα, είμαστε πάρα πολύ χαρούμενοι. Η μεγάλη μας τιμή που ήρθατε από την Αμερική εδώ για να παρευρεθείτε σε αυτή την φοβερή διάλεξη σήμερα. Ε, είστε καθηγητής, έχετε την έδρα του καθηγητή στο Πανεπιστήμιο Yale των Ηνωμένων Πολιτειών. Είσαστε πάρα πολλά χρόνια εκεί. Ποια είναι η εμπειρία σας από τη δασκαλία. Ε, κοιτάξτε, είναι ένα εξαιρετικό πανεπιστήμιο και οπωσδήποτε είναι πιστεύω ένα μεγάλο προνόμιο να βρίσκεται κανένα σε ένα χώρο που επιτρέπει το να καθίσεις να έχεις μια απόσταση από την καθημερινή πραγματικότητα και να ερευνήσεις και να προβληματιστείς με θέματα που αφορούν και την έρευνα αλλά και πολλές φορές πράγματα που μας αγγίζουν και πιο πολύ όπως είναι και το θέμα της Ελλάδας και της κρίσης. Το αντικείμενό σα είναι οι πολιτικές επιστήμες, αυτό διδάσκεται εκεί και έχετε γράψει Πάρα πολλά βιβλία, έχετε κάνει πολλές έρευνες πάνω από πολλά θέματα, αλλά με το ελληνικό θέμα πότε ασχοληθήκατε, καταπιαστήκατε. Σχολήθηκα και εγώ κυρίως όταν ξεκίνησε η κρίση, δηλαδή από το 2009 και μετά, όπως πάρα πολλοί άλλοι Έλληνες, το ερώτημα που έθεσα στον εαυτό μου είναι τι συνέβη, γιατί καταλήξαμε εδώ που καταλήξαμε. Οπότε, επειδή έχω ακριβώ και την, όπως είπα, και το προνόμιο να ασχολούμαι με την έρευνα επαγγελματικά, αφιέρωσα ένα κομμάτι του χρόνου μου στο να δω αν θα μπορούσα να καταλάβω μέσω τη μελέτη τη ιστορία τη Ελλάδα κάτι βαθύτερο για τα αίτια τη σημερινή κρίση και των προβλημάτων που αντιμετωπίζει η χώρα. Η αφορμή λοιπόν για την ερώτηση που σα έκανα είναι το καινούργιο σα βιβλίο. Καλοτάξιδο, σα ευχόμαστε. Πολύ. Με τίτλο Modern Greece, What Everyone Needs to Know. Μάλιστα. Τι πρέπει λοιπόν να ξέρει ο καθένα για την μοντέρνα Ελλάδα. Η βασική ιδέα και το βασικό μήνυμα του βιβλίου είναι ότι δεν πρέπει να βλέπουν τα πράγματα μονόπλευρα. Ότι αυτά τα χρόνια τη κρίση έχει επικρατήσει μια αντίληψη για την Ελλάδα ότι α, τα προβλήματα οφείλονται σε στραβά στοιχεία του ελληνικού χαρακτήρα. Ότι η Ελλάδα πάντα αποτύχανε, ότι δεν κατάφερε να πετυχαίνει του στόχου τη, ότι ποτέ δεν υπήρξε αξιόλογο ελληνικό κράτο. Και προσπαθώ κάπω να διορθώσω αυτή την οπτική, δείχνοντα ότι υπάρχει μια διαφορετική πλευρά και ότι όταν ενώσουμε τις δύο πλευρές, την καλή και την κακή, εμφανίζεται μια εικόνα για την Ελλάδα που ίσως μας εκπλήξει, που ίσως διαφέρει από αυτό που έχουμε συνηθίσει να ακούμε για την Ελλάδα. Ε, από αυτή την άποψη και εγώ ουσιαστικά εξεπλάγιν μέσα από αυτή την έρευνα, γιατί ανακάλυψα πλευρές και πτυχές της Ελλάδας που δεν ήξερα ότι υπήρχαν. Ποιε είναι αυτέ, θα θέλετε να αναφερθείτε συνοπτικά. Όπω για παράδειγμα, αρκετέ πλευρέ που έχουν να κάνουν με πολύ σημαντικέ επιτυχίε τη Ελλάδα. Ανέφερα στην ομιλία μου μερικέ, όπω το γεγονό ότι ξεκίνησε στην Ελλάδα ένα κοινοβουλευτικό βίο πάρα πολύ νωρί συγκριτικά. Ε, μια μεγάλη τραγωδία, όπω ήταν η ε, άφηξη των ε, προσφύγων από τη Μικρά Ασία το 1922-23. Η, η αποκατάστασή του υπήρξε μια τρομερά επιτυχημένη διαδικασία. Το γεγονός ότι α, η αγροτική μεταρρύθμιση, κυρίως το 1917 αλλά και παλιότερα, κατάφερε να μετατρέψει τους περισσότερους αγρότες τότε σε ιδιοκτήτες γης, οπότε δεν είχαμε το είδος ας πούμε, των προβλημάτων που είχαν άλλες χώρες με τεράστιες ανισότητες στην αγροτική ιδιοκτησία. Αλλά και το γεγονός ότι η Ελλάδα κατάφερε μια τεράστια οικονομική ανάπτυξη, ένα τεράστιο άλμα μετά το 1950, η μόνη χώρα στα Βαλκάνια επίση που κατάφερε να αποφύγει το πείραμα του κομμουνισμού, το οποίο αποδείχθηκε τεράστια καταστροφή για άλλε χώρε. Οπότε έχουμε μια σειρά από θετικέ εμπειρίε, οι οποίε πιστεύω αξίζουν να τονιστούν και πολλέ φορέ παραβλέπονται. Πολύ ωραία. Υπήρχαν όμω και κάποιε δυσμενεί συνθήκε, πιστεύετε, που μα φέρανε σε αυτή την κατάσταση που βρίσκεται αυτή τη στιγμή η Ελλάδα. Το βασικό επιχείρημα του βιβλίου είναι ότι πολλέ φορέ η Ελλάδα αναλάμβανε εγχειρήματα πάρα πολύ φιλόδοξα πάνω από τις δυνατότητες της χώρας, με αποτέλεσμα στο τέλος να καταλήγει σε καταστροφές, αλλά οι καταστροφές αυτές είχαν το χαρακτήρα, για μια σειρά λόγους που αναλύω στο βιβλίο, είχαν τη, ουσιαστικά προκαλούσαν την παρέμβαση πολλές φορές εξωτερικών δυνάμεων για τα δικά του συμφέροντα, που όμως λειτουργούσε πολλές φορές με θετικό τρόπο για την Ελλάδα, με αποτέλεσμα το πρόσημο σε αυτό το κύκλο των θριάμβων και καταστροφών να είναι πιο θετικό από ό,τι θα περίμενε κανένα. Αυτό που λέω χαρακτηριστικά είναι ότι η Ελλάδα από αποτυχία σε αποτυχία κατέληξε σε πάρα πολλά θέματα να είναι αρκετά πετυχημένη χώρα και αυτό είναι κάτι που το παραβλέπουμε. Πολύ αισιόδοξο αυτό. Ποια είναι η γνώμη σα για την σημερινή κατάσταση. Τα πράγματα είναι σαφώ δύσκολα. Ε, πιστεύω ότι πρέπει να, η Ελλάδα να βαδίσει συγκροτημένα και οργανωμένα προ ένα καινούριο μοντέλο ανάπτυξη. Να αλλάξει κάποιε κακέ συνήθειε του παρελθόντο. Να καταλάβει ότι κάποια πράγματα που δεν λειτουργούσαν στο παρελθόν δεν θα λειτουργήσουν και στο μέλλον, δεν υπάρχει επιστροφή στι εύκολε μέρε τη ευημερία και να μετατρέψει όλη αυτή τη δυσκολία που συμβαίνει, όπω έκανε και στο παρελθόν πάρα πολλέ φορέ, σε μια ευκαιρία για να ανάκαμψη και αναδιάταξη. 
Αν θα γίνει αυτό δεν το ξέρουμε, αλλά πιστεύω ότι αυτό πρέπει να γίνει. Πιστεύετε ότι μπορεί να είναι εφικτό αυτό? Πιστεύω ότι είναι εφικτό για τον απλούστο το λόγο ότι σε πολύ δυσκολότερες συνθήκες στο παρελθόν υπήρξε εφικτό. Δεν βλέπω το λόγο να μην είναι εφικτό σήμερα. Πολύ ωραία. Ευχαριστούμε πάρα πολύ. Ευχόμαστε και πάλι καλό τάξη εδώ το βιβλίο σας και κάθε επιτυχία να έχετε. Εγώ σας ευχαριστώ.